Good evening, House of Healing Nights. Welcome to the service tonight, YouTubers. How's that? I'm, are you get, I'm getting an echo. Are you? Can you hear that? Does it sound clear? It's clear? Okay. All right, welcome to the uh, service tonight. I got a nice Bible study for you. And uh, I'm ready to go. Our next seminar is on the spirit of comfort. Uh, if you thought the last seminar was crazy, this one's going <laughs> to, this one is really out of there. August 25th, here's our YouTube teaching channel. You go to youtube.com slash house of healing AZ and you get all the teachings whenever you're in the mood. Plus all the other ones that we have, they're on the listed on the right there. We got several different categories. I've been doing this for several years. My uh, local radio shows are uh, on the home page there on hardcorechristianity.com. You hit the home page, hit media, and then go to the streaming radio. All my shows are archived there. If you'd like to help us uh, switch from Google to Good Search and just put in our charity name, they'll pay us while you surf the web. They'll send us a check uh, twice a year. Here's the miracle list. This is quite remarkable. It uh, one for mentally ill Christians, one for troubled Christians, and this thing works 100% of the time. Unfortunately, I usually can't get too many people to actually do the list. What you do when you get the list, you just take it one step at a time. Don't look at the whole thing at once, because then the demons in your head jump out. They go like that. Oh. They say, oh my God, that's too much. No, it's just one step at a time. Number one, just do one and you're on your way. And don't look at the whole thing because it's intimidating. There's my deliverance training course. Uh, please don't go into this ministry uh, unless you've really been praying about it. This is not a ministry to get into on a casual basis. Think about it before you do it. But if you feel God calling you into this ministry, this 18 classes will save you a world of hurt. There's our future, the seven churches of Revelation. That's in the bookstore on Flash Drive. Um, here's our uh, Tuesday night at 6.30 Pacific time, 6.30 Arizona time, our Zoom for the ladies. There's the uh, meeting ID and the passcode. The uh, meetings Tuesday night at uh, 6.30 will be starting on August, excuse me, September 12th. They will resume September 12th in the small sanctuary. Ladies, be ready to go. And here's our Wednesday night Zoom with Brother Rick and Stephanie and the other members of the team. It is fantastic. Lots of people getting healed and delivered on that Zoom. Very grateful for it. You can donate on our app if you want to help the ministry out. We had uh, record giving last year and this year. This year will break last year. Thank you. The donation boxes are on the doors. If you want to donate tonight, thank you. If you don't have any money, you're as welcome here as a multi-millionaire. You can donate on the website if you want to. There's the PayPal button. My uh, deliverance training class is free. It's the fourth Saturday of every month in the small sanctuary. See you then. Adults only. There's my radio programs. I'm on twice a day, Monday through Friday, here locally in Arizona. I mean in Maricopa County. 7.30 in the morning and... 7.15 at night, and I started my new radio ministry on 1100 KFNX Conservative Talk Radio. They started uh, religious programming on Sundays, so I thought, well, I'll get on the ground floor on that. I'm on at 8 o'clock every Sunday morning, 1100 AM. I'll do that for a while and see how that works. 
If you're at YouTube and listen to me, don't forget about starting your ambush team in your church. Two or three of you get together, pray about it. You start picking off the sick people in your church, and every one of them that gets healed, then word of mouth, two or three people call you, then pretty soon you've got a covey of humans all looking to get healed and delivered. I did that years ago at the Dream Center in Scottsdale, many years ago. Let's see, what was that? 2004 or something like that? I did that. Started a little terror cell in my church. I had people left and right coming on Tuesday nights to get all word of mouth. Nobody ever announced it or anything. You don't need an announcement when the Holy Ghost around. He announces himself. Yes, he does. And it just took off from there. Went great. And then and they decided to get rid of me. And that was a big mistake on their part because uh, this personality, <laughs> you got to be kidding. There's my three books in the bookstore. Lori will show you where they are. Healing, Satan, and Healing from Mental Illness. Don't forget about my Sunday morning podcast, which I forgot about last week. I was watching my daughter last week, and I was so wrapped up with, busy with her, I forgot about my podcast. I apologize for that. I've never done that before. Hopefully, I'll never do it since, but this Sunday, I will not forget. I'll see you at 9 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, that's what happens when you get a little older. You get too many things going, and stuff falls through the cracks. And that's what an old person's like. Nine o'clock in the morning, Pacific time. Twitch.tv, put in HCCADC, and I will be with you. And then here's all our platforms we're showing the teachings on. Rick's also on these. Here's the ones that they will be rebroadcast on, I think. GodTube, BitChute, and so on. We like to use Rumble. Put in H-O-H-H-C-C, and uh, all the stuff comes up. H-C-C, A-D-C on the others, BitChute, GodTube, Vimeo. All right. Yeah. Now, everybody here tonight came from somewhere. You're a product of your family tree, every person here. And everything about you. Is a product of your family tree. Everything about you, your skin color, your cells, your face, your body, spiritually, you're a product of your family tree. Everybody is. But when you become a born again Christian, you are not supposed to stay in that family tree anymore. You don't belong in that family tree. You are to transition into your Heavenly Father's family tree. Okay? You had parents in your original family tree. You now have one parent, your Heavenly Father. You have a new family when you're a born-again Christian. You're not in the old family anymore. You are no longer a Gomez, a Juarez, a Smith, a Jones, a what have you. You have been translated into the kingdom of the Son. You don't belong in that family anymore. You have a new identity. Why is your life a failure? Well, thanks for asking. Because you still identify mentally and emotionally with that family that you were raised in, that you were born in, your old family tree. And as long as you keep those generational sins, those generational curses, all those traits from your family tree, and you don't transition into your new family, you will always come up short. You will always be a spiritual failure. You have to develop a new identity. You were in that family, and now you're in this family. As long as you keep thinking you're in that family, 
you're going to have all kinds of long-term permanent problems okay? Your mother and dad are not your parents anymore. Your Heavenly Father is your parent You are not to think and act like your family anymore because you are not in that family anymore you transitioned out of your family into the family of God Jesus warned us about it. He said the day is coming when the parents will betray the children and the children will betray their parents to death He warned us Okay that is not your family anymore and your new identity if you adopt it will yield you enormous spiritual benefits staying in your old family tree is a long-term permanent suck time for you to go you need to cancel your old generation the eternal god came to abram and he said to him, what? Get out of there. Leave. Leave your family. Leave your relatives. Leave your parents. Okay? And go to a land that I have called you to. Okay? Now, did Abraham do it? Basically, yes. Uh, did he screw up? Yeah. Yeah, he screwed up. He was human. You're going to screw up. Okay? Abram screwed up. He brought Lot with him. God told him to leave these people behind. He didn't do it. And he felt sorry for Lot or whatever it was. But anyway, Lot came with him and he had nothing but trouble with Lot the rest of his life, bailing him out, saving his life. It was awful. But anyway, the point of the call of God is he's doing the same to you. Hey, this was your old family over there and now this is your new family. Here, you are to transition out to your destiny. This is your old family tree. There's your parents. There's your grandparents. That's where you came from. Everything about you came from that family tree, right? DNA, genes, cells, whatever. All came from there. Here's an expanded family tree. You've got uncles and aunts and cousins and so on, right? But here's your new family tree. This is where. You are now if you're a born-again Christian and this is your family tree now the old family tree That's not your family anymore What am I supposed to do hate my old family of course not you're supposed to love them But your identity and who you are as a person is no longer with the Smiths and the Jones and the Williamson's and the Cortez's and what have you the Bushanowski's you're out of there and you have translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Anybody with me? Here's your family tree now, friend. That's who you are if you're a born-again Christian. This is what God's calling you to do. He wants you to transition out of that family and start thinking like you're in your new family. You used to think like your parents did when you were raised by your parents, whoever it was, you adopted their thinking pattern. You adopted their habits. You adopted their behaviors. You adopted all kinds of things from them. Okay? You are to stop doing that now and adopt your Heavenly Father's attitudes, opinions, and behaviors. Now you are to develop the mind of Christ instead of thinking like your parents when you were young. You are now thinking like the Lord Jesus and you're to start changing your thinking pattern. If you don't transition out of your old family tree, you will always be a spiritual loser because you will not develop the mind of Christ and you will not think like your heavenly father thinks and that's what God's calling you to do. To transform by renewing your mind. From what? The way you were raised, how you thought with your family, your parents, your brothers, your sisters, what have you, you transitioned out of that crap and you go to your heavenly calling in Christ 
and you renew your mind, you become a new person. Your identity is no longer in that old family tree. You have a new identity, and you are a new creation and a new person, and you need to mentally and spiritually adopt your new identity. You, you better do it quick because AI is going to be doing it soon. They're going to be catching you. Listen to what Jesus said. You are no longer in that old family. He said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they are called a... You are a child of God. Did you know that? Got a lot of backsliders here tonight, don't we? This isn't going to go well. Listen, you are a child of God. You're not a child of Bob Smith or... Carlos Rodriguez. Okay. Hello. Romans 8 says the Holy Ghost was given to you. He's in your spirit, man, right now. All of you have him. And he's the one who witnesses and testifies to you that you are no longer in that old family tree. You are now a child of your heavenly father. You are father's child, and your identity now is no longer what you used to be in your old family. You are no longer a drug addict. You're no longer an alcoholic. You're no longer mentally ill. You have to adopt a new identity as a child of God, not a child of the Williamson family. That's not going to help you, is it? <clears throat> you can cry now as a child of God. You're a daughter of God. You're a son of God. By what? By adoption. Okay? Jehovah, the great God of the universe, had one birth child, and he has millions of adopted children. That would be us. I wasn't a birth child. I'm a new birth child, and so I was adopted into the family of God. I'm an adopted son of God. Under Jewish law, the adopted children had the same rights as the birth children. And they were able to, like the firstborn son in the Jewish family, Abba. That meant the firstborn and only the firstborn could address their dad as Abba. Because that was the closest intimacy you could have with your dad. The, the firstborn only had that privilege. The firstborn in the Jewish family only had that privilege. The other children did not approach the dad like that, right? Now, because you are adopted in the father's family, you can abba. You are like a firstborn son. See that? That's your new identity. That's who you really are. You're not that old person anymore. So you wouldn't be acting like a total loser if you knew that you had a new identity, would you? I don't think so. Would you? I mean, I mean, look at Prince Charles. Have you ever seen that guy? He, I mean, he's sick. He lives a life of total royalty. The guy's a complete kook. But they said, hey, you are the king of England now. And so he said, hey, wait a minute. I'm not a complete moron anymore. I'm the king of England. And he acts like the king of England. They shine his shoes. They, they give him a bath. They wipe his fanny. They bring him anything he wants. They give him anything he wants. Why? Because he adopted a new identity. Hey, I'm not the village idiot. I am now the king of England. Right? And he, he took the identity and grasped it. He'd been waiting for it for years. He waited decades for his mother to die. She wouldn't kick off. It's unbelievable. I think they had her on speed. She wouldn't die. How old was she? 100 and something? Man, he was waiting for her to kick off. Couldn't wait for her to bag it. Why? Because he wanted a new identity. He wanted to be the king. He wanted all the privileges that went with being a king. You are a child of God, and you have 
privileges, such as Abba, such as let us therefore boldly come before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time. And you just walk right in. Why? Abba, I'm a firstborn. I'm the firstborn. I've been adopted. I have all the rights of the birth children. I'm adopted. You're adopted. I did the best I could on that one. The Holy Ghost, Altas himself, tells us that we are the children of God. Now, in the book of Exodus in chapter 15, you've all read it. It is spectacular beyond belief. It is one incredible victory after the other. Unbelievable. Millions of Jews being hauled out of Egypt. Absolutely unbelievable. The ten, the ten plagues of Egypt, right? Now, what, what was going on there? Well, that was a major project, wasn't it? Hauling five, six, seven million people out of Egypt. Hmm, that's a pretty big job. But the bigger job wasn't physically getting them out. The biggest job was getting Egypt out of here. You see, because for over 200 years, these Jews had known nothing but slavery. Over 200 years, every generation, every single one, knew nothing but failure and misery, poverty, slavery, garbage, trash. Generation after generation, every one of them, over 200 years, nobody knew anything but pain and suffering and failure. They knew nothing. Slaves, the Egyptians, all they knew was their idolatry. All they knew was hard labor. All they knew was poverty. All they knew was nothing. Generation after generation had nothing. Zero. Well, what happened there? They're just like us. You are a product of your environment. How you were raised determines what kind of person you are. All these Jews, millions of them, had to be transported from Egypt to the Promised Land. The problem was he was transporting millions of slaves See, when you're raised as a slave, you're raised on drugs, you're raised on alcohol, whatever, whatever way you're raised, that becomes part of your personality. If that's all you know, that's all you know. That's how you were raised. Every Jew, every single one of them, raised in poverty and suffering, misery. Every one of them. Their grandparents, their great-grandparents, their kids, all of them. Everything stunk. What were they? Five, six million slaves. Physical slaves, mental slaves. They were slaves by birth. They were slaves in their mind. That's all they knew. And then it all changed. Or did it change? No, it didn't. Ten plagues of Egypt. Pharaoh coughs him up. He changes his mind. The Red Sea miracle. Wow. Not since Noah had anybody seen a miracle like that. The Red Sea miracle. What was God doing there? Ah, I'll let you in on a secret. It's a secret. How do you change the mindset of six, five, six, seven million brainwashed human beings? How do you change? How do you change their minds? How, you, how do you get them to think differently? 
How do you get a child to think differently who was raised being beaten from for years, grade school, junior high, beaten? How do you get them to change their mindset? That's all they know. Multiply that by five, six, seven million people, and we got a major problem here. What was God doing there? They had all lived a life of total failure. They were all complete mental losers. So God had to start reprogramming their mind. How was he doing that? He had to teach them that he could be trusted. He had to teach them that he could be trusted because for over 200 years, the Jews didn't trust anybody. They had no one they could trust. They were slaves by people who hate them. How are they going to change their minds? Jehovah had to show them supernaturally that he could be trusted because they had never trusted anybody in their lives. Neither had their parents. Neither had their grandparents. For over 200 years, everybody, 100%, trusted nobody because they were slaves. They were human trash. That's how the Egyptians treated them, like trash. So Jehovah had to start doing what? trying to reprogram their minds. How was he doing that? Using supernatural miracles. The ten plagues of Egypt. The land of Goshen. Look, the plague affects Egypt, but look, hey, Jews, it doesn't affect you. See, you can trust me. You can trust me. I know you've never trusted anyone. I know your parents and your grandparents never had anybody to trust, but look, hold on a minute. I'm here now. I'm going to teach you I can be trusted. You can trust me. Hardest thing in the world, counseling people who had abusive fathers, trying to get them to trust their heavenly father when they grew up in an environment where they couldn't trust their Human father. The transition can be difficult to not trusting a human father to trusting a heavenly father. It's tough. What has to be done? God had to show them, look, you can trust me. The firstborn dies, every one of them. Cats, dogs. Kids, doesn't matter. Not in the land of Goshen. Look, you can trust me. You can trust me, Father was saying. Look, all your cattle fine. Look, your kids are fine. I'm taking care of you. You can trust me. 200 and something years worth of slavery and trusting no one ever. Now had to be ground out of their thinking pattern. We don't trust anybody. A kid raised in an abusive environment grows up without trusting adults. They're leery of everybody. They've got paranoia. They don't trust people. They think people are, they have ulterior motives. The Red Sea. Phew, biggest miracle on the books. What was he really saying there? Hey, hey, listen to me. You can trust me. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to watch out for you. 200 and something years. Let's, let's bag it. Let's trash it. Look, look. They went through on dry ground. Four or five million people walking through on dry ground. You can trust me. And they're celebrating. There it is. Verse 12. Total celebration. Miriam, the prophetess, she's leading the way. She's out in front. She's dancing like crazy. Remember that? Yeah, I think that's, somebody said that's when they invented hip-hop, but I don't think so. But she's out in front dancing, 
before the Lord. Hallelujah. She's spinning all over the place. It's a time of celebration. I don't blame them. I'd be celebrating too. Why did God want them to celebrate? He was trying to get their minds renewed, transferring decades of distrust of people to being able to trust him. You can trust me. I'm going to take care of you. Well, then verse 13 kicks in. Well, the ten plagues of Egypt were what? Nothing more than God telling you, listen, I'm going to take care of you. You can trust me. Here's ten reasons you can trust me. Here's the Red Sea. You can trust me. I'm going to take care of you. You can trust me. Oh, let's skip that part. What was God trying to do? Same thing he's doing with you. You and I are no different than brainwashed Jews with 200 and something years of slavery. When you become a born-again Christian, your mind has to be renewed. Renewed for what? Being able to trust God without relying on your own abilities and intelligence. They didn't have this verse, of course. Solomon wrote it way long after the Red Sea miracle. But here's what God was doing right here with those miracles. He was trying to get them not to lean on their own understanding. But in all their ways, just trust him. You can trust me. You can trust me. You can't trust your family. You can't trust the Egyptians. You can't trust the devil. But you can trust me. I am trustworthy. I will take care of you. No matter what, you can trust me. And I'll prove it to you. You as a born-again Christian, you're happy as you can be right now that you've been listening to this Bible study. You're just flopping with joy in your seat because you haven't gone through near the suffering and heartache these Jews did. 200-something years in, in vicious slavery. Everybody born into it. Everybody dies into it. What was God doing? The exact same thing he does with us. He wants you to believe this verse and receive it. As an adopted child of God. He wants you to leave your family behind, whom you can't trust. Human beings are not trustworthy. They may tr that you may trust them for a little while, but they always make mistakes. They always screw up. That's part of being a human being. That's what humans do. They screw up. Don't raise your hand. Your Heavenly Father is not a human being. He does not screw up. He is 100% trustworthy. You can trust him. These Jews don't know that. They have no idea. So he's trying to prove to them. He's proving it to them. Hey, you can trust me. Watch. Why are there so many Christians who are weak and failures here they lean on their own understanding during trial times of trials and tribulation they try to figure it out rationalize it out think about it ask some other human about it get two or three different things and then check youtube and before they're done they're as big a failure as they were before they started because they're trying to figure stuff out using their own understanding and their own rationale that's going to get us into a lot of trouble. And Father's trying to get you to do the opposite. Let 
Then it says in Exodus, everybody's read this. Moses brings out all these millions of people out of Egypt. They go through the Red Sea. They go to go to the wilderness of Shur. They're three days in the wilderness, and uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, what happened? Oh, something that God allowed. He didn't cause it, but he allowed it to happen. What's the good news here? They ran out of water. This is great news. Why is that good news? Because your trials and your tribulations are being allowed by God to teach you that you can trust him. All the water they took out of Egypt after three days in the wilderness of Seir, gone. Now, they're starving for water. Right, Erica? Now, they had an option. Shall I continue to trust the God who gave me the Red Sea, the God who performed the ten plagues of it? Shall I keep trusting? Or shall I panic? Well, let's see what they did. Well, let's check it out. Let me take a big guess here. Oh, oops. <clears throat> they came to Marah, which means bitter waters. And the waters were not, weren't any good. They were, you couldn't drink it. What's going on here? God allows you to face disappointments. He he wants you to face a disappointment. Why? Because he's a masochist, masochist or he's a sadistic. No, no, he wants you to learn to trust him. Nobody learns to trust God when everything's going great. When you're partying, you're not under any stress. Well, that's not a trial at a party. You got everything, everything given to you. you. All your needs are met. There's no need to trust then. Oh, what's going to happen to you? Well, what's happening to some of you right this very second, you're going through a very dry, hard period. Good for you. Why are you going through that period? Oh, you're disappointed. They came to, the, they found some water and they couldn't drink it. When you're starving for water and you find water and you can't drink it, wow, that's a downer. That's a medical term. And what happened then? Instead of continuing to trust, what did you do last time you had a trouble? Instead of continuing to trust, you started murmuring. Murmuring is an emotional cancer that will wipe out all your prayers. will leave you wasted in the desert. They start murmuring. Start complaining, start whining. Nah. I'm not being treated right. They stay out, I know who they're talking to. What happened there? They weren't trusting him. So what happened? God's mercy stepped in again. What's he doing there? He's providing miracles, trying to get them to change their slavery mindset. Hey, I know you don't trust anybody. I know you've never trusted anybody. I know you're, you were raised in that family. I know how your parents treated you. I know your stepdad. I get it, but you can trust me now. I'm your heavenly father, not your stepdad that abused you. I need you to renew your mind. I need you to renovate your thinking process because your heavenly father can be trusted. The other ones cannot be trusted. He say, hey, Moses, get your, get down there. Go down to the waters. Gas this stuff in the waters. What happened? Maybe a miracle, another incredible miracle. What was he doing there? Nasa. He was testing them. Why are you going through the stinking trial? It's not a stinking trial. It's your biggest blessing to date. Father's allowing you to face that because he wants you to learn 
that he, unlike your family, can be trusted 100% of the time. No one else can. That's why you're stuck in this crappy trial, this stinking tribulation, this rotten crap they dumped in your lap. It's not even my fault. What am I doing? What happened? Why am I going through this? Oh, I just told you. He allowed it to happen. So that when he sends you a miracle and gets you out of it, you will trust him next time the devil comes for you. Okay. Huh? Anybody nodding off? Because I got the slapping in on you tonight. I'm ready. <laughs> you going through a trial and tribulation? Good for you. Nasa, you're being tested. What do you want the Jews to do? Here's what he told them, but he knew they couldn't do it. But this was his goal. This was his goal. You can't tell somebody what to do who was raised over 200 years of slavery and have them go, oh, really? That's what I should do? Okay, I'm fine. That's not going to happen. You can't tell some kid raised in an abusive family, oh, you're, lo you're unconditionally loved by right now. You're fine. Your future's bright. They're not going to... It's not going to happen. It's not going to, they ha your mind has to gradually be renewed and change. Very few people just, boop, oh, I got it. No. Six million Jews, they just didn't get it. Yeah. If you do this, the Lord said, I will do that. Translation, if you will just follow my instructions, you can trust me. I'm trustworthy. You can trust me 100% of the time. It looks bad, it feels bad, it sounds bad, doesn't matter. You can trust me 100% of the time. Yehovah Rapha is what? I am the God who heals you. It's me. I heal. Not in slavery. Everybody got, everybody got sick and died. Not in Egypt. Oh, they had witchcraft, sorcery, all kinds of potions. Half the people died. No, this is different. What's he trying to do here? Get them to trust him. I'm your healer. Trust me as your healer. I'm your healer. Rafa. There it is. Then they went to where? Elim. Yeah, there it is today. There were 40 palm trees there at that time. Remember that? There were 12 wells there. Seven of them are still good to this day. The rest of them have been filled in, but there's still wells there to this day. Saudi Arabia, there it is. We have, we have something similar to Elim in, in, in America. Here it is, 29 palms. In California. I threw that in as a geographical tidbit for you. I knew you'd enjoy it. Then they went to the wilderness of Sin, Exodus 16. What happened? Oh no! What happened there? Egypt came back. Egypt came back. Egypt, I can't trust anybody. Egypt, everything is going to go bad. Egypt, everything stinks. What's God trying to do? Renovate their minds. Well, how's he going to do that? By waving something at them, going over and talking to them? No. The only way people change is by overcoming hardships. Having everybody hand you everything and every go all good things happening to you, oh, it's fantastic. That doesn't cause people to change. God allowed them to starve and be hungry and thirsty. Why was he doing that? Why didn't he send a bunch of angels with giant water buckets 
to seen before they got there What's wrong with the good Lord? Can he plan ahead? What has he got planning problems? No, I don't think so What he's trying to do is get you to understand That he can be trusted and you need to stop complaining Here they are griping about that they're even alive. Hey, all the firstborn died. We should have stayed back there and died. Would have been better than this. What were they really saying? I still think like a slave in Egypt. My mind is a slave. That's what slaves do. They work themselves to death and they die. They all die losers with nothing. In poverty with no hope with nothing that's it so their mindset as you can see here is still back in Egypt getting them out of Egypt physically was the easy part getting Egypt out of here getting your old life out of here getting your old generations out of here that's the hard part that's tough Hey, at least we had something to eat there. At least we had something to drink. You know, that's better than this. We got nothing. What's God trying to get you to, them to do? Hey, wait a minute. Everything looks bad. It sounds bad. It smells bad. But you can still trust me. You can trust me here. Yeah. The financial problems are real. The sickness is real. Your, your, your kids are in trouble. That's real. What's he trying to say to you? You can still trust me. It looks bad. Sounds bad. It is bad. It doesn't matter. You can trust me. What does Moses do? Exactly what we're supposed to be doing. Right in the middle of a trial and tribulation, you run to the Lord. Why? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean to your own standing. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Moses ran to the Lord and acknowledged him. Hey, these Jews that are on the rampage are going to stone me. They don't have anything to eat. They don't have anything to drink. They got all kinds of other personal problems. He says, well, I'm going to test them again. And grace came through again, right? I'm testing you. Why is that trial? Why are you going through this thing? Is anybody going through a really bad trial right now? Just raise your hand real quick. Only a couple people are. Oh, no, there's some more. Yeah. You going through a bad trial right now? What's happening here? Your heavenly Father is allowing it to happen. Why is he doing that? Because he wants you. To learn to trust him. He wants you to learn. Change your mind. He wants to get Egypt out of the Jews' minds. As long as they keep thinking like a slave, they will never reach the promised land. They will never make it. God had to pull Egypt out of their minds. God said, look, I'm going to send you another miracle. I'm going to send you some man. What does the Hebrew word man mean? Yeah, it means exactly that. What the heck is this? Man. What is man? Weird. Well, here's what it was. I have no idea what it was, but it was some kind of nutritious food that fell out of heaven. It rained out of heaven. Right? You know the story. And there was restrictions on how you could collect it, how you could store it, eating it, and so on. Remember? 
manna, man. <clears throat> Guess what they did with that man? And yeah, 40 years on that stuff. Well, that's that's a tough one. Yeah, that's hard to do. What was he doing with man? What's the purpose of manna? Hey, you can trust me. Can you imagine that? That was a bigger miracle than the Red Sea. Every morning it rained manna for five, six million people. Every morning they went out, filled their baskets up with whatever it was. I guess it was a bread or something, you know. <laughs> Hostess cherry pie, something similar to that. They went out and picked them up off the ground. They named it Man, which means, what is this? No one knew what it was, but it was miraculous. But what it really was, was Father saying to them, Hey, you're starving? You can trust me. I'm going to take care of you. I grew up in a family with alcoholics and we were uh, neighborhood white trash and we didn't have money for food half the time. I couldn't trust my parents for basic necessities. Where did the necessities go? They drank them up. When they were in slavery in Egypt, they couldn't trust anybody. And Father's now trying to teach them, look, I'm using this manna as a sign that when you're in trouble and everything's bad, you can trust me. I will come through for you. I will win for you. That's what it really meant. That's what manna really is. You can trust me. You know the story of the, the 12 spies, right? Everybody read that. They were told by Moses, look, I want you to go scout out the promised land. Come back and give me a report. Now listen, don't come back and give me a bunch of opinions. And don't come back and tell me what to do. I just want you to go give me a report of what you're seeing. I want you to bring some fruit back, some other things back to demonstrate what's over there. That's all I want you to do. That's what they did. They came back. But what happened? Ten of the twelve spies circled through Egypt before they came back. Ten of the twelve spies went back to Egypt in their minds. And they came back like a slave, afraid paranoid, scared, worried, fearful for their lives, wondering when they were going to get it next, wondering who else was going to die next. And they gave Moses an Egyptian report. We can't take this land. We can't do it. There's too many of them. There's too much. Egypt, two of them, two of the spies, did not come back from Egypt. Who were they? Joshua and Caleb, that's right. They're stronger than we are. They're, now remember, these people had seen the Red Sea miracle. No, one, no one's stronger than the Holy Ghost. That's ridiculous. That statement's absurd. Doesn't matter. If you've got an Egyptian mindset, you could see the biggest miracle you've ever seen in your life and get nothing out of it. You ever witness to somebody and say, well, you know what? If I saw a miracle, I'd believe. No, they won't. No, they won't. If you've got a slavery mentality, it doesn't, have, it doesn't matter how many miracles you see. 
I'm not joking. We have people here who have had some of the most spectacular deliverances you could ever imagine. Hundreds of them. Many of them have gone back to sin and back to failure, back to addiction, back to drugs, back to alcohol, back to mental illness. Hey, whoever gets your mind gets the rest of the person. Ten of the twelve spies came back from Egypt instead of the promised land and gave Moses an Egyptian report. Hey, we're screwed. What were they afraid of? What was the report? People. People. Yeah, people are the number one thing. Number one thing that scares Christians. People, spouses, kids, co-workers, church people. People. They said, so my God, we, they're stronger than we are. God, there, there's Nephilim there. Giants are there. They had seen all the miracles of Egypt. They had seen the Red Sea split. Millions of people went across on dry ground. They saw it with their own eyes and never left Egypt here. We saw Nephil, the Nephilim, the giants, you know, the Goliath type guys. Anak. That entire race was giants. We were like grasshoppers in our own sight. What, it, what is God trying to do here? Wow. Why are you going through this trial? He's trying to get you to understand that what you see isn't really reality when you mix it with faith. As Wigglesworth once said, I am not moved by what I see or what I feel. I am only moved by what I believe. They looked with their Egyptian eyes and they saw themselves as grasshoppers. You were raised in a dysfunctional family where you had low self-esteem and a low self-concept and now the devil's putting the pressure on you and you're going back to your earthly family and seeing yourself as a grasshopper. and You see everybody else as a killer. What's God telling them? Hey, I can be trusted. I'm not faced by giants. I'm not faced by other people. See, you don't wrestle against flesh and blood. People are not your problem. They never have been your problem. Your problem is your own mind. That's your problem. How you think is your problem. If you see yourself as a failure, a loser, a weak, as a grasshopper. You lose out on the promised land, your destiny, your call from God, what, you're, what you've been designed on this earth to do and to be. That's what you're interested in. That's what you're going to lo lose if you see yourself as a grasshopper. This was a mental exercise, not a physical one. King David mentions this incident in Psalms 150 years later. Remember Psalm 78? They tempted God, they turned their back on him because they didn't believe. They went back to Egypt. That's a strange verse, isn't it? It's weird. How, how can God be limited? That's weird. I thought he was all-powerful, all-seeing, all-knowing. He is until he restricts it to your free will. 
Oh, well, only a couple people heard that one. See, God is sovereign and has the ability, because he's sovereign, to restrict his sovereignty to your free will. What happens to you in this life isn't decided by God. It's decided by you. For all the promises of God in Christ are yes and amen. God already said, I got everything for you. Are you going to get it? Well, that's up to you, not up to God. Because God restricted his sovereignty. In your case, to your free will. You decide. If you're a grasshopper, you're a Gideon, you mighty, mighty man of God. You decide. Well, the Jews decided they were back in Egypt. They got stuck in the desert for 40 years. Why? That whole group had to be removed. It was sad. There they are, collecting their mon. There they are, every morning going out and getting the buckets. That was a new career if you were a Jew back then. Yeah. Mana collectors. You had to sign up for it. Then they went to where? Rephidim. Okay. And what happened there? God, who's omniscient, knew before they got there, they were going to run out of water. Correct? Yeah. How come he didn't do anything about it? The good Lord screwing up again? He's a, he's a poor planner. We need to get him one of them Microsoft daily planners. Is that what we need? No, I don't think so. He knew there wasn't going to be any water there. But what was he doing there again? What was he doing there again? T trying to get them to trust him. Even when things look bad and sound bad and feel bad, you can still trust me. I got it covered. For I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. They come after Moses again. What were they doing? Murmuring. Murmuring. What were they really doing? They had gone back to Egypt. Mentally, they were gone again. They started griping, filing complaints, whining. Blah. What was God trying to teach him? Hey, you don't need to do that. You got to learn to trust me. See, trust in the Lord with part of your heart. And the, I don't think it was part. He was trying to get them to learn to trust. Human beings will not trust by nature. They have to face hardships to learn to trust. That's the only way it works. Revelation 2, Revelation 3, he that overcomes will reap these benefits. Correct? Said it seven times, two chapters, didn't he? He that overcometh, King James. Well, you got to have something to overcome to be an overcomer, correct? How many of you are having a smooth life and everything is going great? Well, you know, I don't. I'm not trying to offend you, but. If that's a consistent pattern over the years, my guess God doesn't have anything really great he's calling you to. I'm sorry. You can go ahead and send me that email. Hey, Mike, here's an email for you. <laughs> stick that up your fanny. No, I'm not going to stick it up my fanny. If your life is nice and smooth, it's been that way for a few years, God probably is not calling you to anything great. You think I'm joking. I am not joking. If you're having this crap and that crap and this crap and you're in Crapville, that's a red flag. You've been called by God to something dangerous in the spirit world because he's using hardships 
to get you to learn to trust him. If everything's going smooth all the time, year in and year out, you're chilling. And you're going nowhere. Are you listening to me? Hey, you should have killed us again. There they go again. They're back in Egypt here. See that? Oh my gosh, the cattle, everything dead. Oh gosh, what are you doing? Moses said, they're ready to stone me. Why? They weren't stoning him. It was the Egyptian mentality. They were stoned in Egypt. They died in the mosh pits. God allowed all these things to happen to the Jews as they left Egypt. Why? He was trying to get them to learn to trust him. Because they had been raised around untrustworthy people. You couldn't trust anybody in Egypt. Listen, here's what I want you to do. Go out in front of the people there. Go grab your Red Sea rod. <laughs> Remember that, Moses? I sure do. I got that in a case in a museum. Okay, go get it out of the museum. Go get your rod. Remember what I told you? Put the rod in. Moses was yelling, Lord, the Egyptians are here. What do we do? What do we do? What's going on? He goes, go! <laughs> Sitting there doing nothing for the rest of your life will get you absolutely nothing, and you're going nowhere. Okay? Miracles only happen when you get up and go. Go get your rod again. Take it out to the rock. Take that rod out there. In front of everybody. Why are you doing it in front of everybody? I'm trying to teach these Jews. I'm trying to teach them. Look, you couldn't trust anybody in Egypt, but you can trust me. Watch. I'm doing these miracles for you. Trying to get you to trust me. And not lean on your own understanding. Trying to figure it out yourself. Because if you do, you'll end up back in slavery in Egypt lost again. What did he do? Well, you know the story. Boom. Uh, he hits the rock. What happens? Man, unbelievable miracle. It's in Numbers chapter 20. There it is. That rock is still there to this day. Here's a picture of it. This rock was the rock that all that water came out of. A river came out. Millions of people Multiple millions of livestock, everything, everybody drinking came out of the rock. Remember that story? What was, it, what, was, what was going on there? God knew they were going to be starving again. He knew they were going to be thirsty again. He did it deliberately. He knows. He saw your trial coming. He saw your hardship coming. He saw it before it got there. Why did he allow it to happen? Because... He's trying to get you to trust him. He wants you to trust him. You can't trust God when everything's going hunky-dory. That's, Lat that's Latin. There's the rock. It's still in Saudi Arabia to this day. Then later on, the Amaleks attack attacked them, right? There was a war broke out. They, hated, they saw these Jews invading their land. They hated them. They wanted them all dead. They went out to fight. What happened? Yeah, went to the rod deal again. Moses held up his rod. What happened? They won. When he got tired and dropped it, they lost. When they propped him up, they won. What's all that about? He's trying to get Egypt out of their minds. Listen, if you do what I tell you, you can trust me. I'll take care of you. Raise that rod 
and you win. Just do what I tell you. Why don't people obey God? Why don't they listen? They don't trust him. They don't trust him. They're using their own understanding. Well, if I do that, this will happen. If I don't do this, this will happen. I'm, I'm rationalizing it. I'm thinking it out. No, you're losing. You're a slave in Egypt. You're failing again. Yeah. After the war, they had Yehovah Nasi. What is that? The Lord our banner. What was he doing there? He was... He was showing them, listen, you can trust me. I told you what to do. Just do what I told you to do, okay? I'm not an Egyptian. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to manipulate you. I'm not, I'm not like your parents or, your, or how you were raised. That's not how I am. Your Heavenly Father is not that way. He's completely trustworthy. He wants you to trust him. That's why people don't trust God. They, they don't do what he says because they don't trust him. They don't think it's going to work out. They're going to have to come over the better way. Let's skip that one. Peter said, Beloved, don't think it's strange that this fiery trial is doing what? Pirasmus. It's a trial. It's a test. You're not supposed to think it's some strange Xenos, a foreign thing. No, you're, spo you're supposed to be rejoicing. <laughs> yeah, I know this sounds nuts. You're going through a trial. It's difficult. It's hard. And God's telling you to rejoice. Why? Because you can trust him. He's got your back. He's got you covered. He's already figured it out for you. He wants you to trust him. How's he going to do that? By sending in truckloads of blessings? No. People can't learn to trust God without overcoming hardships. Difficulties. Challenges, pressure. That's the only way people by nature learn. Good thing is happen good things that happen to people, they're pretty easily forgot, but really bad things, man, they remember them for a while. They remember them. Particularly church people, when they offend them. You come up with a great idea at church, remember that? God gave you a word. You shared it with the church people. He said, hey, that word sucks. What? You took an offense. Then they got offended at you. Then somebody else got offended at you. Offenses breed offenses. What happened then? You said, well, these heathens don't deserve me at this church. I'm going to go to that church. I got news for you. The people in that church don't deserve you either. No offense. You've got to be able to overcome your trials to find the will of God. You've got to be able to trust in the Lord with all your heart and not lean on your own understanding. You can't go back to your old family. You're in the family of God now. Your parents are gone now. Your heavenly father is your parent. He's trustworthy, is he not? So you can rejoice when things are bad. I know that sounds crazy. Rejoicing when things are bad, yes, because you're, you're being trained for something great. Every profession is like that, isn't it? Athletics is like that, isn't it? You start out in T-ball, then you go to Little League, huh? Then you're in City League, 
you know, in church league and in college. Hey, every time you step up the ladder, the competition gets stiffer. That's the same way it is in the spirit world. If you want to fulfill your destiny and become a Holy Ghost person, you're going to have to learn to overcome. And if you're going through some bad trials right now, my suspicion is something big is coming your way. If you don't go back to Egypt and start complaining and whining and murmuring, you do that, then you got to take the test over again. Anybody following me? You follow this, right? This is exceeding joy when things get bad for you. What Peter's saying. That's a good thing. Because you can trust him. Peter chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4, if you are on a deed so, if you are verbally abused for the name of Jesus, happy are you. You're happy if someone says bad things about you. Well, that's the opposite of being a human being, isn't it? Yeah, you're not a human being. You're a born-again child of God. You're not in your old family anymore. You don't react the way you did then. When your own family trashed you, when other, other people trashed you, you reacted negatively. That's normal for a human being. It's not normal for a child of God to do that. You are not to do that. You got to get rid of this Egyptian mentality of vengeance and paying people back and getting even and finding justice. I want justice. You're happy. I know it sounds crazy, but this is how you grow. Why should you do this? Because you are not a regular person anymore. You're somebody special. You are an heir of God. You have an inheritance. Huh? Many people don't have any inheritance at all, do they? Huh? Anybody here? Parents dying had zero inheritance. I'll start out. I had, I had zero. My parents left me nothing. Anybody? Nobody else? Everybody got hit the lottery? Okay. So since I'm the only one, I'll just go with me. Uh, some people out there don't have any inheritance in this world. Nobody left them a cotton picking thing. Nothing. That's not you. That's not you. You're not. A child of that family anymore you transitioned into God's kingdom you you are a joint heir of heaven right here with Christ you are Abba like a firstborn child what's he telling you look these trials and tribulations these challenges you're facing listen in the long run they'll come off as nothing it's nothing A thousand years from tonight, what you're going through now, we probably won't even remember. <laughs> I know I won't. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking to some of you, you're looking at me like I'm from Mars. But a thousand years from now, I'm not going to remember you looked at me like that. It's not going to bother me. It doesn't bother me. That's what it is. Your challenges now, they're will fade into oblivion. It's nothing. You are on glory road. If you're a child of God, you are you have an inheritance in Christ. You're a special person. You don't belong in that family anymore. Your old generation is gone. Get rid of it. You're a blessed person if you're perse persecuted for righteousness sake. Now, most born-again Christians are not blessed because they're persecuted because they're idiots. That's not what it's saying. It says righteousness sake, not for acting a fool. If you're a Christian, you're being persecuted, you probably deserve it. I know some of you, and that, yeah, that's exactly right. You do deserve it. No, it's righteousness sake, doing the right thing. 
Okay, and well, that's that's an oddity, but that's the persecution is a blessing for you to grow. People don't grow unless they face adversity. Right? If you put the heat on somebody, they'll either quit and collapse, and God can't use them, or they'll overcome it and move on to greater blessings and greater miracles. That's how it works. Christians have to be weeded out. Well, Brother Mike, no, no, I, I, I learned it, the word of faith. I learned that you just got to speak it out and blab it all out. And the blessings just fall in your lap. Okay. You were taught false doctrines. Word of faith is a bunch of crap. You have to go through hardships and overcome. You don't just blab blessings out. Do you? How's that working for you? You've been using your word of faith, have you? Yeah, why don't you send me an email and tell me all these two things. No, you got to be a fighter. You got to learn. You got to learn to overcome. You got to learn to forgive. Why am I going to do that? Because God's going to allow people to hurt you. You didn't hear me. You have to learn to forgive. How am I going to do that? When everybody's treating me nice, they think I'm wonderful. Well, if, what if I'm like Brother Mike, where you... Everybody thinks you're great all the time. No. The only way you can learn to forgive people is when they treat you like garbage. Treat you like garbage. What is that? A divine appointment by God who allowed that to happen to you so you could learn to forgive. Brother Mike, would you pray for me so I could stop taking offenses? Uh, no, because what's going to happen is if I do that, people are going to start offending you. <laughs> Elizabeth, Elizabeth, stop it. You can't learn to not take offenses if people don't offend you. Is, is, is this really rocket science? Am I I'm visiting from NASA? No, I'm not. If I pray for you for that prayer, people will start offending you. I'm going to unleash a torrent on you. Well, that's witchcraft. No, it's God's blessing. You have to learn not to be offended. Do you learn not to be offended by everybody telling you how wonderful you are? No! <laughs> Satan will be attacking you, criticizing you, running you down, degrading you. Why? So you can be happy and win. You have to learn not to take an offense by being offended. You have to learn how to forgive people who treat you like garbage. I thought Christianity was all happiness, peace, love, and prosperity, and abundant life, Brother Mike. I thought that was what it was. Okay, listen, you've been listening to too many people on YouTube. You need a reality-based faith system. Okay, where do you find that? I'm not sure, but when you come here, that's what you're going to get. It's a reality-based faith system. The only way for you to grow is for you to get booted out of the nest because the, 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 the eagle... The eagles are not going to leave the nest if the mother keeps coming to feed them. Okay, sooner or later, they've got to get the boot.
I watched a nature show one time, and you know, there's there's three baby chicks or something in the nest, and the hawks or whatever it was kept, kept coming back and bringing them crap to eat, and one of the birds, little ones, wasn't getting it, wasn't getting any, and he kept pitching a fit, and the other ones would steal it from him and take it. And I thought, oh my, I felt so sad. I felt so sad for that third one. And then later on they came back and it was dead. But the other two were soaring like eagles. Okay? Hello? I was wrong to feel sorry for the dead one. Father set the system up like that so that only the strong survive. Because you have to be strong to survive. Okay. American Christians are, are gutless losers because they want everything handed to them. They want blessings falling from heaven like manna. Uh, that's not how you grow. That's not how you become a warrior. That's not how you become a person the devil fears. I got to be helping somebody. <clears throat> if any of you suffer, suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed. You're being trained. For what? Glory. It says it right there. Verse Peter 4. Listen, God's got you covered. He's got your back. There's no parasmos. There it is again. Same Greek word. It's the trial that's overcoming you. The trial. It's coming at you. It's a normal trial. It happens to everybody. But, Jews, God is faithful. You can trust me. I'm not going to allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able to bear. I'm not going to allow it. I'll make a way for you to get out of it. You can trust me. You don't need to go back to Egypt. I got you covered. I'm with you. Whatever you're going through now, it's well worth it in eternity. Did you, know, did you know that every time you overcome something, God lays up a reward for you in heaven? Did you know that? Even the littlest things Jesus said, giving somebody a cup of water or something, you do that in Jesus' name, there's a reward put somewhere. How does that work? I don't know. I don't know anything about it. I just know it happens. Okay? I don't have any insight on any of that. I'll be honest with you, I don't even think about it. I just keep moving forward. But the reality is, this crap you're going through here is temporary. It leads to incredible glory there. It looks like junk here, but it has great spiritual value there. It says it right here. What are you doing there? Listen, Egyptians, there they, there they come. There's the Egyptian soldiers. There's the desert. There's no water. What you see with your eyes will ruin you. What you see through the eyes of faith will save you. What you see and you hear is not your reality as a child of God. It was before you became a child of God. Before you were a Christian, yeah, we were stuck with this crappy world and everything in it. Now it's different. You're not stuck anymore. Somebody's got your back. Somebody's provided a way of escape. Somebody's helping you that you can trust. And he wants you to trust him without having to see it in advance, right? The things that you see are what? Oscaros, temporary, they're seasonal. They just come here and there. This is what we're facing. What you can't see is eternal, Ionius, age after age after age. What you're overcoming now will be of your benefit 
thousands and millions of years from now in eternity. Once it goes up in the book, it can't be removed. You've got it. If we suffer here, we're being trained to do what? Be kings and priests. Your hardships are your training for your royalty in eternity. You're being trained not to be like King Charles where they put some complete moron and put a thing on their head. And that's a king. No, that's a joke. This is eternal kingdom. And this little stuff that you're good is temporary. It's occasional. God's trying to change your mindset, right? Like he did Wigglesworth. All he knew was losing his temper and doing plumbing work. That's all he knew. Plumbing and getting pissed. The two Ps. But God, over the period of years, renovated Wigglesworth's mind. He no longer thought like a plumber. He no longer had a temper. How did you do that? By overcoming hardships. Two weeks ago, there was a big fight on pay per view. Some guy named Crawford, another guy, guy named, uh, uh, what was that other guy's name? Prince? Spence. Spence and Crawford. And this was a big fight, real big one. Both these guys were like unbeatable. In fact, they were unbeatable. They all both had unbeaten records, right? Clash of the Titans. Listen. Five years ago, those, those guys couldn't have whipped your kindergarten teacher, okay? They had numerous fights. They won this one. They won that one. They won this one. They won that one. Then they won this one. Then the, and then, two weeks ago, they're in the super fight. The exact same thing is true in the spirit world. You don't just boop, pop out and, oh my God, I'm a super warrior. Now, that's it. Everybody gets healed. Everybody gets delivered. Let's plow through Phoenix. Boom! No! It doesn't work that way. This fight, that fight, this fight, that fight, this fight, this fight. Overcome, 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 overcome. Grow, 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 grow. Learn, 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 learn. Boom! That's how it works in the spirit world. You have to overcome your, this little one, then, then, then that one, and then this one, and then that one. When I was a kid, I was a comic book collector. And in the back of the comic books, they had ads. And this was back in the early 60s, and in one of the ads, it had this guy named Charles Atlas in the ad. Little block ad in the comic book. Black and white. Little ad like that. This Charles Atlas guy, it had a picture of him there, full of muscles, and then in the picture next to him, it showed him almost like a stick figure of what he looked like when he started lifting weights. And then you were supposed to send in some money or something to buy something from him. I think it was a training kit or something. I can't remember. But anyway, the point is, Charles Atlas started out looking like a victim of anorexia. But somebody waved a magic wand over him. He's bulging with muscles. No! Day after day, month after month, year after year, grinding it out in the gym. 
he became a multi-millionaire, selling little packets of how you too could look like that. That was a crock of crap, but anyway, he's making all kinds of money off of it. It doesn't matter. It's all marketing. Everything's marketing. It's all lies. The point simply is you don't walk in and two days later you look like Schwarzenegger. It doesn't work like that. And it doesn't work in the spirit world. You overcome, then you overcome, then you grow, then you grow, then you step, then you grow. You push it. You learn to push it. Listen, when people are trashing you, why are they doing that? Why are, why are people talking down to you? Why are they criticizing you? Why is that happening? Well, they're rotten people, Brother Mike. They're, they're just terrible. They're the, no, God's allowing it to happen. For what reason? You're in training. See, you have to learn to not let things bother you by listening to people saying things that would normally bother you. You don't just wake up one day and go, I'm good. No. You got to learn that what people say about you means nothing. You got to learn not to take an offense. You know what my biggest challenge is with marriage counseling? I get crazy people coming to see me. I really do. I could write a book on it. The first call I get is usually the victim spouse. The one that is being abused usually calls. And they have finally convinced the other spouse to go get help. But they don't, they're not going to call. This spouse is. You know what my biggest challenge is with married couples? 99% of them are you know, junkyard dog crazy. Because they've been living with the other person for years. They're gone. <laughs> is to get them to see who's really talking to them. That's the toughest thing. Because a marriage that's falling apart is spiritual. Spiritual. And this person says that nasty thing, and this one says that. But actually behind the curtain there, like the Wizard of Oz, Behind the curtain is not, there's an old man back there. There are spirits in that each spouse triggering the other spouse by saying something or doing something. The demons know will trigger them and hurt them, make them angry, get them frustrated. On and on it goes. If I can get the, both spouses to see that there's a spirit world behind their behavior, their attitudes, that marriage, vast majority of them, they're going to get saved. If I can't, and the person still thinks it's them, well, she said this and he did that. Well, no, wait a minute. Time out. Okay, there's a spirit behind that person saying that. And they're being motivated and encouraged and pushed to say those asinine, imbecilic, idiotic, hurtful, dreadful things. It's not just them. It's spiritual. If I get that in here and get Egypt out of there, that marriage can be saved. Most of the marriages I've counseled with are saved. Very few of them got divorced. The ones that got divorced, nah, it's that person. It's her. It's him. It's not. Why is God allowing that? So you would learn exactly what I just told you. You're not wrestling against flesh and blood or your husband or your wife or your kids or your parents. There's a spirit behind that behavior, that attitude.
that's your real enemy. God's only allowing the person to act like a jackass to help you overcome. You don't just wake up one day and say, you know something? Sticks and stones can break my bones. No, it doesn't work like that. You've got to learn to take a beating and overcome it and let it go. You're in training. You're going to win. All right, let's wrap it up here. You're supposed to be exceedingly glad because your reward is great in heaven. Yes, it is. Let's close then. Here's Wigglesworth, famous quote by him. He worked a lot of years and took a lot of beatings to come to this conclusion. Literally years before he arrived here. What does it say? Okay, what he's saying is, what I see in my emotions do not determine anything. What determines is what I believe. Right? Here's another one from him. And let's close there. Your trials, if you're going through nothing and haven't gone through anything in a long time, you know, good for you, and the probability is you're going nowhere. I'm not talking to you right now. I'm talking to the people that are going through it right now. That is a good sign. That's a, that's a positive sign that God's got plans for you. Because that only happens... When you learn to overcome. When you learn to overcome. <laughs> All right, let's let's go ahead and pray then.